Well, good morning, all of you. So good to be here at the Palm Springs Drive Church of Christ, where we worship God, study His Word, love one another, and reach the lost. If you're visiting with us, so glad that you have come. We're going to be in Acts chapter 23 this morning. Acts chapter 23. <clears throat> Paul's in Jerusalem here, and he is being tried before the Sanhedrin Council. And we read about how that meeting went here in Acts 23. Verses 6 through 10. It says, But perceiving that one group were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, Paul began crying out in the council, Brethren, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees, and I am on trial for the hope and resurrection of the dead. And as he said this, there occurred a dissension between the Pharisees and Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor an angel, nor a spirit. But the Pharisees acknowledged them all. And there occurred a great uproar, and some of the scribes of the Pharisaic party stood up and began to argue heatedly, saying, We find nothing wrong with this man. Suppose a spirit or an angel has spoken to him. And as a great dissension was developing, the commander was afraid. Paul would be torn to pieces by them and ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. Have you ever seen one of these? <clears throat> it's called, good, my GIF worked. Let me see. Yes, the GIF, you know, that it moves. That's great. I was worried it wasn't going to move. It's called Newton's Cradle <clears throat> because it demonstrates Newton's law of the conservation of energy in that when the momentum of that swinging ball hits the other ones, the, the energy is not lost. The energy is not destroyed. It is transferred through the ones in the middle to the one on the end. And as Paul stands before the Sanhedrin, he, he's like the steady, immovable middle section of the Newton's cradle with two religious extremes pounding on him from both sides. One with the Pharisees and the other with the Sadducees. You see, the Pharisees were hyper-conservative. They had great respect for the authority of the Old Testament scriptures. They believed in a supernatural view of the world with God in control and the existence of a spiritual realm and the fact that our souls will live on beyond this life. In fact, they had such a high view of scripture that they added rules and traditions to God's law in order to keep from breaking it. That's how important it was to them. The Sadducees, on the other hand, were like modern-day liberal theologians, also known as progressives. They believed that some scriptures were more authoritative than others. They didn't, you know, they didn't buy all that stuff about the soul living on and angels and demons and judgment in hell. They represented the minority of the rich intellectual elite, whereas the Pharisees if you could sum it up this way, whereas the Pharisees added teachings to the scriptures, the Sadducees removed teachings that they did not agree with. And I want to talk to you this morning about the threat of progress, specifically the dangers of what has been called progressive Christianity. This movement is becoming more and more popular, and because it is shapeless and formless and, and undefined, it can be tricky to detect. And so I want to talk about that this morning, and I want to show you how the Sadducees show us this kind of religion really isn't anything new. Let's talk about it. What is progressive Christianity? Well, first I need to give credit to uh, Alyssa Childers, who wrote a book about this, uh, and many articles um, and blog posts, and I also read uh, or watch videos from a man named Mike Winger who, who made videos about this subject. And they both really helped me kind of formulate my thoughts on, on this subject. You know, we all want to make progress, don't we? I mean, spiritual progress is, is wonderful. In fact, we even have the spiritual growth cycle here at PSD to help us make progress, to grow in our knowledge of God and of his word. Paul, when he's in Philippi and he's in prison, he's not sure if he's going to live or die. He can't decide whether it's better to live or die. Because if he, if he dies, he gets to go be with Christ. But if he lives, he says, I get to be with you all, Philippians. And here's one of the benefits of that. He says, convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. So God wants us to make spiritual progress. But this isn't the kind of progress 
progressive Christianity is all about. Darwinian evolution teaches us that over time we've evolved as a species. And so now that we've reached, you know, human level, you know, we were apes, you know, and we were fish and all that. But now that we've reached human level, well, now we're, now we're more sophisticated. And what progressive Christianity does is it takes that, that Darwinian concept and applies it to us spiritually so that over time the human species has been evolving into more spiritually mature people who can now see things about God that the original Bible writers could not see and could not know. Progressive pastor David Felton writes this, <clears throat> far from being fallen creatures trying to return to a mythical Eden, notice he, he put the word mythical in there, Human beings are emerging as a species from more primal and baser instincts to become more responsible and mature beings. So instead of what the Bible teaches, which is, yeah, we are supposed to be heading back to Eden. God is trying to bring us back into his presence because humans just become more sinful over time. And that's why we need salvation. Well, progressives believe we're becoming more morally sophisticated over time. And the idea is that those people, you know, like Paul and James and, you know, the the other apostles, and even the Old Testament prophets, they were very primitive in their understanding of God. But over time, now that we've evolved and made social and moral progress as humans, we know the truth about God on a much deeper level than they did. And so here is my main takeaway from this morning's lesson. Not all progress, in quotes, <laughs> is progress. Not everything that is called progress is progress. Elisa Childers wrote an article called Five Signs Your Church Might Be Heading Toward Progressive Christianity, and I'm adapting these points from that article. Here are five ways this morning to identify the progressive Christian movement. But before we get into that, would you turn to Matthew 22, please? Matthew 22. <clears throat> We used this story a, uh, about a month ago in the sermon I preached on logic, but I want to use it this morning as a template to show you how the Sadducees fit the framework of progressive religion. So Jesus confronts the Sadducees here in Matthew 22, and the Sadducees, they're trying to disprove the resurrection by bringing up some hypothetical situation based on a law in the law of Moses. Well, let's read this section from Matthew 22. 23 to 33. And then as we go through the sermon, we'll kind of unpack this. Verse 23, on that day, some Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to Jesus and questioned him, asking, teacher, Moses said, if a man dies having no children, his brother as next of kin shall marry his wife and raise up children for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers with us and the first married and died and having no children, uh, left his wife to his brother. And so also the second and the third down to the seventh. Last of all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they had all married her. But Jesus answered and said to them, you are mistaken, not understanding the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But regarding the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God? I am the God of Abraham the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. <clears throat> the Sadducees held the first five books of the Old Testament, also known as the Law of Moses, in much higher esteem than the rest of the Old Testament. They believed that the teaching of the resurrection, yeah, that's something that came later in the scriptures. But the Law of Moses, you know, the the most important part of the Old Testament, well, that never taught the resurrection at all. So in their minds, they did not respect the authority of all of the scriptures, only some of them. And Jesus knew this, by the way, which is when he answers their objection about the resurrection, he uses the book of Exodus to do it. He says, okay, I'll use your favorite books to teach you that even your favorite books teach the resurrection. He mentions God's appearance to Moses at the burning bush. If you think about it, by that time, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they were already long since dead. And yet, God said to Moses, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He doesn't say, I was 
the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or I used to be their, you know, back when they were alive, you know, I used to be their God. No, I, I am still their God. Why? Because they are still alive. Their souls are still alive. And they are in a right relationship with God, even beyond the grave. Now, in the, sorry, I meant to click there for you. In the modern progressive movement, Jesus and the Gospels are held in much higher esteem than the rest of Scripture. So Jesus is now put up on this pedestal to say that his teachings have greater authority than all the rest of the, the entire Bible. Here's a quote by a Lutheran minister named Nadia Boltz Weber. There are those who will say that it is, quote, dangerous to think we can decide for ourselves what is sacred in the Bible and what is not. I reject this idea, and here's why. The Gospels are the canon within the canon. The point of gravity is the story of Jesus, the Gospel. The closer a text of the Bible is to that story or to the heart of that story's message, the more authority it has. The farther away it is, the less its authority. Do you see what she said in that first verse, or that first uh, sentence, rather? She admits in the first line, it is perfectly okay to pick and choose what we treat as sacred in the Bible. And we do that based on whether or not it agrees with what Jesus said, as if what Jesus says somehow contradicts the rest of Scripture. And you will see this idea floating around and popping up even in, in, in popular culture. In fact, uh, when President Obama in 2008 was interviewed, he was asked what he believed about same-sex marriage. And he said this, I would just refer them to the Sermon on the Mount, which I think is, in my mind, for my faith, more central than an obscure passage in Romans. So you see, just like the Sadducees took what the law of Moses said over what the rest of the scripture said, as if they you know, somehow contradicted or taught something different, so too progressives are saying, listen, if I'm going to listen to Jesus over Paul. I'm going to listen to Jesus over all the other prophets as well. But the problem, of course, is that we can't do that. We cannot pick and choose between Jesus and Paul. Because what the apostles Paul said was what Jesus was saying through Paul. Paul said this about himself in 1 Corinthians 14, 37. If anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, let him recognize that the things which I write to you are Jesus' commandment. They, they are his, his commands. The Holy Spirit got his words from Jesus and then delivered them to Paul. And so Paul and Jesus can never be pitted against each other. And by the way, the same Holy Spirit was also speaking through the Old Testament prophets as well. So there's no contradiction there either. See, a major part of the problem is that progressives don't view the Bible as the actual word of God. They buy into the false narratives that there's a bunch of errors in the Bible and contradictions. And so it's not a, a perfect book. It's more like a spiritual travel journal that records what people thought about God, but not actually God's word itself. Progressive writer Peter Inns said it this way, human beings can't do better then they're very best at any given moment to communicate about God as they understand God. And Scripture faithfully reveals the evolution of our ancestors' best attempts to communicate their successive best understandings of God. Do you see how dangerous the threat of progress really is? It says that the Bible writers were incorrect about God. Because it wasn't God actually speaking through them. It was just, they were just kind of doing their best to, to tell you what they thought about God and their own limited human understanding. And just like their understanding about God evolved over time, well, now, now we've evolved to an even higher uh, level. And so now we know things about God and can fill in the gaps in the Bible writer's misunderstandings. And Jesus' answer for the Sadducees and for modern-day progressives is in Matthew 22 in verse 29 when he says, You are mistaken, not understanding the scriptures nor the power of God. They don't understand scripture. Jesus never treated the scriptures as mere human understanding. He treated it as the authoritative word of God. In fact, in verse 31, he says, This is what was spoken to you by God. He doesn't say, and this is what Moses did his best to kind of communicate what he thought God was saying. No, he says God actually said this to Moses 
at the burning bush. And progressives struggle with how it is that God could possibly use fallible human beings to preserve his infallible word. But when you struggle with understanding that, it leads Jesus to say, your second problem is you don't understand the power of God. Just like the Sadducees doubting God's power to raise the dead. Not all progress is progress. It's amazing that progressives pride themselves on being new and evolved and enlightened, but they're really just repeating the 2,000-year-old pattern of the Sadducees. Secondly, feelings and opinions have the final authority. The Sadducees, they didn't believe in the resurrection, not because the Old Testament didn't teach it, but because in their opinion, God didn't have the power to raise the dead. And, you know, even if he did have that power, well, he couldn't resolve the issue caused by the Leveret marriage law in Deuteronomy. So Deuteronomy teaches that if a woman's husband dies, her brother-in-law needs to marry her. Well, if he dies and then her other brother-in-law marries her and seven brothers-in-law end up marrying this woman and they all die and the woman dies, well... Won't there be a brawl in heaven? That's what they say in verse 28 in the resurrection. You know, who, whose wife of the seven will she be? For all of them are married to her. And sadly, instead of the Sadducees saying, you know what, maybe, maybe our understanding about this is off, they elevate their human understanding to the final authority on the matter of the resurrection. And the modern progressive camp does the same thing. Since we are clearly more evolved now, there are certain things that simply cannot be true. For instance, they cannot stand the thought of the exclusivity of Jesus, the thought that someone like Gandhi or perhaps a kind Muslim friend that you know would be lost eternally for rejecting Jesus. That is too offensive. That is just not right. And so even a verse like John 14, 6, where Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. You will find an interpretation of that from the progressive side that says that, no, Jesus was just speaking to his disciples, not to all humanity there. And so Jesus is saying he was the only way for his disciples. That's what he meant. The doctrine of hell, most offensive of all doctrines for progressives. Rob Bell, a major progressive author, he wrote about hell in his book, Love Wins. He says this, it's been clearly communicated to many that this belief about hell is a central truth of the Christian faith, and to reject it is, in essence, to reject Jesus. This is misguided and toxic and ultimately subverts the contagious spread of Jesus' message of love, peace, forgiveness, and joy that our world desperately needs to hear. Another progressive author, Richard Rohr, puts it this way, Jesus tells us to love our enemies, but this cultural God, he, he, he calls the God who would send somebody to hell our cultural God. Well, he sure doesn't. Jesus tells us to forgive 70 times 7, but this God doesn't. Instead, this God burns people for all eternity. Most humans are more loving and forgiving than such a God. We've developed an unworkable and toxic image of God that a healthy person would never trust. Why would you want to spend even an hour in silent solitude or intimacy with such a God? I quoted earlier from Nadia Boltz Weber. She wrote a book called Shameless, A Sexual Reformation, where she argues that the Bible's sexual ethics are antiquated and outdated and actually keep us from flourishing. And if we really want to flourish sexually, we need to affirm sex before marriage. We need to affirm same-sex marriage and abortion and even moderate pornography use. Do you see the pattern here? It's all about what I feel is best. And what I, in my elite, evolved understanding, believe is clear that, you know, the Bible teaches that this just can't be correct. And it's keeping us, the Bible, stuck in old ways of thinking that repress us and lead us only to hatred and to violence. Brian Zond is another major progressive preacher, and he really struggles with the violence in the Old Testament. It's just too disturbing for him. And so he says this, I never go wandering around in the Old Testament without Jesus. So at any given moment, I can pause and say, Jesus, what do you think of that? And Jesus can say to me, Brian, what do you think of that? Well, it seems to me, Jesus, that in light of what you taught us, we have to rethink this passage. And I think Jesus says, amen. Do you see it? Ultimately, he's saying, Jesus leaves it up to me to decide what I think or feel the text should be saying. 
His feelings and opinions are the final authority here. And Jesus' answer to the progressives is the same as it was to the Sadducees. You are mistaken, not understanding the scriptures nor the power of God. The Sadducees didn't understand the Bible's teaching about the resurrection, and modern-day progressives don't understand the Bible's teaching about the seriousness of sin and the necessity of God's wrath as a just judge. They don't have faith in the power of God to know exactly what we need to flourish sexually. And they don't understand that if there were other ways to be saved, there's no way Jesus would have come to die for us on the cross. Isaiah 55, 8, and 9, God says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways, excuse me, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Not all progress is progress. Thirdly, core Christian doctrines are being tossed aside. Excuse me, one second. Think about how essential the core teaching of the resurrection of the dead is. God's plan in the beginning was to be in a loving relationship with mankind forever. And yet if you, like the Sadducees, denied the resurrection of the dead, well, that means that God created us, but then sin won. And because of sin, well, you know, now God can't spend eternity with us anymore. How absurd. The Sadducees might, have, might as well have been atheists at that point, if that is their belief. In progressive circles today, many think that they're just too enlightened now to believe in miracles and that miracles in the Bible, they weren't actually miracles. They were more like metaphors to teach us certain uh, lessons. Bishop John Shelby Spong takes a metaphorical view of Jesus' resurrection. He says that, yeah, you know, he can buy that Jesus' soul was resurrected back to God, but Jesus wasn't resurrected bodily at, at all. This is what this... Um, supposed bishop is saying, and he says this, when people hear it, this metaphorical view, they grab onto it. They can't believe the superstitious stuff, but they were brainwashed to believe if they could not believe the literal resurrection, they could not be a Christian. And I tried to help people get out of that literalism. What the resurrection says is that Jesus breaks every human limit, including the limit of death. And by walking in his path, you can catch a glimpse of that. He's not alone in his take. Many progressives are denying the literal bodily resurrection of Jesus, and, and they're just saying it's, it's a metaphor for overcoming odds in life. You know, and if you're feeling defeated, you, know, you can make a comeback because of the resurrection of Jesus. And think about this. They're denying the literal bodily resurrection of Jesus and yet still claiming to be Christians. When, if you'll turn with me now to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15, this is what Paul says. And there, in this chapter, Paul's dealing with people who are also denying the resurrection of the dead. But here, they're actually different from the Sadducees. The Sadducees denied that your soul would even live on. The Corinthians would have believed that your soul would live on, just not your body. <laughs> and Paul, he points back to Jesus. And he says this in 1 Corinthians 15, look at verse 13 and 14. If there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain. Your faith also is in vain. If you drop down to verse 16, if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless and you are still in your sins. It's really a misnomer, isn't it, to call it progressive Christianity. Because if you deny the bodily resurrection of Jesus, if you deny the miraculous, you cannot call yourself a Christian. You might as well be an atheist at that point, which unsurprisingly is where progressive Christianity usually leads people to. Progressives will also deny the virgin birth of Jesus. They deny the existence of hell. They believe Jesus healed people, but not through miracles, but rather through love and acceptance and welcoming them into a loving community, which has, you know, a healing effect even on your body sometimes. I heard a progressive interpretation of the feeding of the 5,000. And this person said, you know, the miracle wasn't that he actually fed you know, 5,000 and multiplied those loaves. The, the miracle was one of compassion, you see, because everybody in that crowd, they already had their own bread. 
but they were being selfish and they didn't want to share it and they were keeping it to themselves. Well, when this little boy walks up to Jesus and he shares his bread, well, then that moves the crowd and they and they're just ashamed of themselves. They realize, man, I need to be, have a more sharing attitude. So everybody brings out their bread that they were hiding. And now they all share this wonderful meal together. And that was the miracle there. A miracle of compassion. In fact, it, it was so miraculous in their compassion, they had plenty of bread left over, they would say. Major problem. When you remove the miraculous power of Jesus, you remove his authority to command your life. If he did not perform miracles, he is not who he claimed to be. And so why would we listen to him other than a mere, out of mere admiration for a life well lived? Progressives even deny that Jesus came to die for our sins. Let me say that again. They deny that Jesus came to die to forgive us of our sins. They feel, well, they'll say he forgives us. But that he didn't die as punishment for our sin, to take that punishment on himself. They feel the idea of Jesus taking the punishment of our sin is just cosmic child abuse. But really, Jesus died to show us how bloodthirsty we are, especially those in the power structures of society, and to show us the importance of loving and forgiving others. Now contrast that to what Paul says in the same chapter in 1 Corinthians 15. Listen to what he says in verse 3 and 4. He says, I delivered to you, verse 3, of first importance what I also received that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Progressives are denying all the essential core doctrines that Paul says I delivered to the Corinthians of first importance that Christ died died for our sins, that the authoritative Old Testament scriptures foretold his death, foretold even his substitutionary atonement in Isaiah 53, for instance, and that he was literally and bodily raised from the dead on the third day. Jesus' answer to the progressives is the same as it was to the Sadducees who were denying the miraculous core teachings of the scriptures 2,000 years ago, and that is, you are mistaken not understanding the scriptures, nor the power of God. Not all progress is progress. Number four, historical Bible terms are redefined. Interestingly, because the Sadducees were in the minority and the view that there's no resurrection was not popular, they would tell people, oh yeah, we do believe in the resurrection. But they wouldn't really tell you what they meant by that. They had actually redefined that term to mean that you would live on through the legacy of your children. That's what resurrection <laughs> meant to the Sadducees. You would die. You know, you would never be you know, actually resurrected. But your kids, you know, would live your life through you or you would live through them. <laughs> and that was the resurrection in their minds. But do you see how deceptive that is? Because if you heard a Sadducee say, oh, yeah, we believe in the resurrection, you would assume you knew exactly what they were talking about. But that's not what they meant. Likewise, progressives today will use Bible terminology. They'll say they believe the Bible is inspired. But when they say that, they don't mean inspired in the sense of God breathed, in that it's the word of God. They mean inspired in terms of like what we would say to an artist, like what inspired you to you know, paint that painting or record that album? They'll say that Jesus needed to die, but not for the reason the Bible says. They'll say that Jesus resurrected from the dead, but not the way the Bible describes. They'll say they believe in hell. But what they mean is the experience of evil on the earth. That, that hell isn't an eternal place of punishment. It's wounds left behind on this earth by genocide and by hatred and by crime. They say they believe in love. But what they mean by love is that we need to make people feel good. And if we confront anyone and make them feel uncomfortable, well, that's just not love. That's why this is so dangerous, because false teachers can lure people in by making it sound like they're teaching Christianity. They'll use a lot of the same terms, but it may be years before people finally learn what the preacher means by the terms that he's using. And by then it's too late because gradually, you know, being in a group that, that's teaching this kind of stuff, they've, they've opened the door to the idea that the Bible, you know, it's not really perfect and it can be reinterpreted. And so by the time they learn that the preacher has redefined the terms, they're willing to let him or her do it. Jesus says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, 
but inwardly are ravenous wolves. On the surface, they look like Christians. They use Christian terminology, but it's just sheep's clothing, and the wolf lies beneath. And wolves, wolves are mistaken, and wolves don't understand the Scriptures, nor the power of God. And the final sign of progressive Christianity is that the world's biggest problem is social injustice, not sin. I'm not sure we know enough about the Sadducees to be able to draw a perfect parallel here, but I do find it interesting that the Sadducees were in the ruling class, typically. They were in the leadership, judging positions. In fact, the Sanhedrin Council was made up of a majority of Sadducees. And if you think about it, if Sadducees deny the resurrection and believe that this life is all there is, they would be pretty motivated to focus all their attention on this life. Likewise, if modern progressives believe that hell is what we cause here on the earth by oppression, if they don't believe that Jesus died to pay for our sins, but rather to show the power structures how bloodthirsty they are, then it makes sense that fixing the societal ills here on this earth would be their main focus. They don't believe that what the world needs most is the gospel message that Jesus died for their sins. They believe that what the world needs most is for people to just love on them. And as a result, churches simply become benevolence organizations. The focus is to relieve the oppression of the poor and to help those in need and to work to overturn oppressive power structures in society. Now, I need to be clear. Jesus cares about injustice. Jesus is angered when poor people are oppressed. He, he wants us to help the needy and to do what we can in these areas. But it doesn't matter how much food you give to the hungry if they don't have the bread of life. It doesn't matter how much money you give to the poor if they don't have the spiritual riches in Jesus. Even if Christians could make life better for every person on the planet, if they die and haven't had their sins forgiven, then it's all for nothing. It'll be lost eternally. Elisa Childers gives this illustration. She says, let's say you go to the hospital to get treated for cancer, and the doctors and nurses, they treat you with so much tenderness and just, just use kind words, and they make sure your bed is comfortable and your pillow is fluffed, and they even go out of their way to bring you the best meal they can find in, in the hospital. Well, what happens if they never actually treat the cancer, though? Have they really loved you? <laughs> you would say, well, these people seem loving, but they haven't really loved me because they haven't really... Give me what I need. Real love gives people what they need, even when it's uncomfortable for them. And what people need is the forgiveness of sins. But here's the issue. Progressives do not believe that our main problem is spiritual cancer. They believe that you are perfect just as you are. And as we share our common humanity with each other by helping the oppressed, they'll see the truth that they... And I read this. From progressive authors, they will see the truth that they were never separated from God in the first place. All they need to do is embrace the beauty of their humanity and get rid of their fear and shame. That's what they need the most, is what the progressive gospel teaches. That's why Elisa Childers' book is called Another Gospel. Because it's not the gospel of the Bible And Jesus' answer is the same for the Sadducees as it is for modern progressives today. You are mistaken, not understanding the scriptures nor the power of God. Let me very quickly give you three practical ways to avoid the progressive trap. You're already armed well to see the signs of it and to know what it's about. But here's some practical things. Number one, understand the scriptures. (laughs) You don't want Jesus to say, you don't understand the scriptures. That's what Jesus hit them with. And people get sucked into progressive Christianity because they buy into false narratives, false pictures of who God is. If you think about it, if you believe that God is just this bloodthirsty warlord or a cosmic child abuser, well then it makes sense that you would want to try to find a way to re-explain and make that God a better kind of God, doesn't it? But that's not the God of Scripture. People also get sucked in. Because they grow up in hyper-conservative congregations that make up their own rules and, you know, bind where the scriptures don't bind. And if any group disagrees with them on any little point, well, then they're going to hell. And it's just very judgmental and very critical and harsh. And when these people grow up and they see, like, 
actually these people aren't, you know, aren't that bad. Like maybe they're wrong. They throw, they throw the baby out with the bathwater and just start reinterpreting everything. And they, they swing to the opposite extreme. They start off on the Pharisee end growing up. And so they swing to the Sadducee end when they're an adult. But that's, that's an extreme. They get sucked in when they see leaders fall. People in leadership positions not living right crushes their, their faith and now they're just, they're not sure they buy all this Christianity stuff. When you know the scriptures though, you'll be like that middle section of Newton's cradle. <laughs> you'll, be, you'll be steady. You'll be immovable like Paul was despite the constant pounding on you from either side of the religious extreme positions. Secondly, trust the power of God. Just because we don't understand how something's possible doesn't mean it's not. The Sadducees didn't understand how the resurrection was possible, but that didn't mean that the resurrection wasn't true. I don't know how my laptop works, but it does. I don't know how trigonometry works, but it does. You know, I'm so terrible at math and science. I won't tell you how long it took me to figure out how Newton's cradle works, but it does. So instead of making our feelings or our opinions, or our lack of understanding the final authority, let's trust the God who had the power to create the universe that Jared mentioned in, in his prayer. I'm pretty sure if he can create the universe, he can handle all the little smaller miracles that we read about in the pages of the Bible. If God could create the universe, I'm pretty sure he can make food for 5,000 people. I'm pretty sure he can walk on water. I'm pretty sure he can raise the dead. And finally, don't just ask questions. Seek the answers and then accept the answers. You'll see why I'm saying that in a second. Because Elisa Childers, she had her own journey into progressive Christianity and then back out of it. And here's, here was her observation. She said, they are far more interested in asking questions than they are in finding the answers. There's almost like this intellectual elitism that comes with, it's like a postmodern approach to religion that comes with asking questions and basking in the uncertainty of things. And the biggest sin you can commit to progressives is to be certain about something. And so what happens is, even if they go look for answers and they find concrete answers to their questions, they still refuse to accept them because if I accept the answers, that means I have to be certain and it's arrogant to be certain. Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever that we may observe all the words of this law. There are some things that we just won't be certain about. We can't be certain about and we'll always have questions about. But God has given us certainty on a lot. And he's given us certainty on the questions that we really need the answers to. So there are answers if you'll go find them. If you are struggling with doubts and questions, come talk to me. Come talk to the elders. We will point you in the direction to find those answers. We absolutely need to make progress in our spiritual growth. And sometimes that means facing and working through our doubts and working through our, our questions. But just remember, not all progress is progress. I'm going to offer an invitation to those that may be here or maybe watching in that aren't Christians. And I want to assure you this morning that Jesus died for your sins and he died for mine. He didn't die just to set a good example about, you know, how to love each other. He died because we needed him to die for our sins for our forgiveness. And that's the good news of the gospel. I hope that you'll accept that this morning by believing in Jesus, by repenting of your sins, confessing him as your Lord and being baptized. And you've done that already. And maybe some progressive ideas have been seeping in, whether that's through your studies online or YouTube videos you've been watching, or maybe some coworkers <laughs> or, or people at school. And you've allowed these progressive thoughts to kind of seep in and you're starting to question God and doubt God, it's okay to have questions. It's not okay to stay there forever. There are answers and the Lord wants you to be certain that you can have a relationship with him. You want to be certain about that? You can be this morning. Let us help you do that. Come forward.